Hi, and welcome back to the wonderful world of the scientific hypothesis. My name is Brad Alger. This little video is meant to help strengthen your intuition about hypothesis testing, as well as to provide a deeper appreciation for the complexity of science. An earlier video introduced the concept of the deep implicit hypothesis as another name for fundamental assumptions or simply background knowledge. In this video, we'll see how these unstated hypotheses actually affect the practice of science. We'll also take an unconventional view of the so-called control experiments that scientists do, and we'll see why they're important. Finally, I'll explain how these elements combine in what we'll call the web of hypotheses or the hypothesis web. I'll use those phrases interchangeably. And we'll make it clear why this web is not a barrier to testing hypotheses. So the web of hypotheses, what is it and what does it mean for science? To appreciate what's going on with the web, let's first start by looking at the hypothesis, the simple view of the hypothesis that we've had up until now. Basically, the hypothesis is an explanation. It makes predictions. We test the hypothesis by testing its predictions. And as a result of the test, the hypothesis is either falsified or corroborated. But if we think about it, we know this really can't be the whole story because all hypotheses depend on existing scientific facts. These are things that are assumed to be true. They constitute our background knowledge or what I've been calling deep implicit hypotheses. This means that any hypothesis depends in turn on other hypotheses. Our hypothesis, in other words, does not exist in isolation, but it exists in a network or a web of other hypotheses. It depends on these hypotheses. They, in turn, depend on other hypotheses and so on. So every hypothesis depends on a network or a web of other hypotheses. The problem is that a hypothesis might be false because a hypothesis that it depends on is false. So the question is, can we ever test a hypothesis in isolation? Let's look at how this web might affect something that we've been talking about, and that is the situation with the unfortunate fish who are dying in the lake nearby. The main hypothesis we had was that acid rain is killing the fish. This hypothesis, however, depends on another hypothesis, and that is that acidic water can kill fish. There's another hypothesis yet that acid rain is formed in clouds, and this hypothesis depends on the hypothesis that smokestack chemicals can form acids. Now, when some philosophers realize that the web of hypotheses existed, they leap to the wrong conclusion. So here's our philosopher, and he concludes that because of hypothesis webs, science can't test hypotheses. Now, this was completely baffling to a great many scientists because scientists have been testing hypotheses all the time, provisionally but successfully. The question is, how do they do this in the face of the web of hypotheses? Science deals with the hypothesis web in three ways. First of all, it relies on deep implicit hypotheses. This is the background knowledge I've been talking about. Second, it performs control experiments. And third, it relies on multiple hypotheses. So here's an example of our main hypothesis embedded in the web of hypotheses. And the first thing that science does is do control experiments to test and eliminate some hypotheses. So for example, in the case of the fish in the lake, it might do a test to confirm that the fish in the lake are sensitive to acidic water and so on. There are a number of these control experiments that would be done. Now notice when control experiments have eliminated some hypotheses, they've actually simplified the web in great many ways. Another way that the web is simplified is to depend on background knowledge, which we've said is a collection of well corroborated hypotheses that are not currently being tested. So although they exist as part of the web, these hypotheses can be ignored at the moment. We always keep in mind, as we said earlier, however, that they could be tested at any point. The hypotheses that are left are tested by the main hypothesis, which makes predictions about 
the other hypotheses that we do test. Another major strategy for dealing with the web of hypotheses is to use multiple hypotheses because multiple hypotheses will have non-overlapping webs. For instance, here is hypothesis one. This might be our acid rain hypothesis in the scheme I showed earlier. And notice now, if we have another hypothesis, which is that instead of the acid rain killing the fish, it's actually low oxygen, this hypothesis, which would be the main hypothesis in the center, makes an entirely different or almost entirely different set of predictions. It depends on an almost entirely different set of secondary or other hypotheses. Similarly, if the third hypothesis had been that the parasites are killing the fish and neither the low oxygen nor the acid rain, then this would involve an entirely different set of web of hypotheses. There are, of course, some areas of overlaps of these webs, but obviously they are much less than the web itself. And so substantial simplification of the process of dealing with the hypothesis webs uh, comes when using multiple hypotheses. So to summarize what we've said about the hypothesis web, every hypothesis is embedded in a web of other hypotheses. Testing a single hypothesis tests the other hypotheses as well. We must isolate each hypothesis as much as possible in order to test it. And science deals with the problem in three main ways. It relies on certain deep implicit hypotheses, which are assumed to be true and not tested at the moment. It does control experiments, which eliminate some of the other hypotheses. And it also uses multiple hypotheses, which exist in the context of different hypotheses webs. Notice, of course, that all test outcomes are provisional, subject to rejection or modification and retesting and so on. So although the web of hypotheses is a genuine situation, science can deal with it by being aware of it and taking these steps. Thanks for watching. Remember to give it a thumbs up if you like it and subscribe to hear more. See you next time.